So I have a suggestion for a column that you could write. Easy for me to say. Thank you. So you could take colorblindness as one and you could take um, structural racism as the other. You could say colorblindness is the trope du jour favored by those who are critics of the uh, Ibram X. Kendi's and Robin D'Angelo's of the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so they talk about colorblindness and you could take uh, institutional racism as the, the trope of uh, favorite trope of the uh, anti-racist activists like Ibram X. Kendi and uh, Robin D'Angelo and my colleague Trisha Rose and our friend Tana Hasi Coates and all those people. Nicole Hannah-Jones, let's not leave her out. Um, and in both cases, it's not entirely clear what people are talking about. I mean, a little bit more precision would be helpful. So on institutional racism, of course, every time you see a disparity by race doesn't mean that there is some evil force in the world that has produced it. So what are you talking about specifically? Um, And with respect to colorblindness, no, of course, you don't mean literally not seeing color. So what exactly are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Now, I think the stakes here are are pretty high. I think they were illustrated by the uh, contest or conflict between Justice Clarence Thomas and Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson over the student for fair admissions case, where Thomas is basically saying the Constitution is colorblind, you know, and he's saying the 14th Amendment and he's got his exegesis, and I'm not endorsing it, I'm just saying that's what he's saying. And uh, Justice Jackson is saying the country is not colorblind by a long shot. And it seems to me they're like talking past each other. Yes. There. Yes. You know. Or is it that Justice Thomas has a higher wisdom that we muddling around down here dealing with the real world can't quite see. Because we have to be open to that. The Constitution is colorblind and therefore knock all this stuff off. Even if the world isn't colorblind, that's where we need to go. Right. Or, and that's I'm, what inclined that, that I'm not inclined there, but you can't dismiss it out of hand. But then what does what does Justice Jackson mean? And yeah, yeah life isn't colorblind, but what do you do about that? Yeah. How do you, th- th- this stuff is really hard. They're not talking about the same thing. Exactly. And it frustrates me. So I'm teaching this in, in this undergraduate course I'm teaching right now on race. And we're going over the uh, court's decisions last uh, summer in the uh, uh, Students for Fair Admissions Affirmative Action case. And I must say, I have more than a little sympathy for, it won't surprise anybody, Justice Thomas's position, which is the Constitution. Is colorblind. I never said the society was colorblind. We're talking about what the Constitution says. The Constitution is our framing document. It's been forged through the second founding of the Republic, which was the Civil War, Lincoln, the post-war amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the reckoning with slavery, a very concrete historical reality of the shaping of American culture and law. Slavery, the legal ownership of persons. They happen to be Negroes, Blacks, African-descended peoples. That's what the court was talking about when it framed the 14th Amendment. And when it said the law, uh, interpreted through uh, subsequent Supreme Court decisions and so on, is colorblind, that's what he means. It, it's in no way a sociological claim. And yet Justice Jackson's rebuttal and Sotomayor's rebuttal to the majority opinion is saying, how can you say that the Constitution is colorblind when the society is so race uh, conscious and race imbued, um, and un- unstated there, I think is an, uh, is a necessary to make their argument work. Is the claim that further, of course, everyone's going to have to concede that the society is racially tinged, that the law should be adapted in such a manner as to remedy or confront that racial uh, reality. That's where uh, Roberts and Thomas are saying, no, it shouldn't. We're going by the uh, original understanding of the framers on their reading of the framers. And we're protecting the law, the Constitution. We're not trying to fix the society. We're trying to protect and interpret the framework that's going to guide us because the 21st century is going to bring new challenges to our republic, like all those Asian students queuing up to get into the best schools in the country the way the Jews were doing 100 years ago, and we're going forward into the 21st century. Uh, we need a framework of law suitable to the uh, mission of, you know, pre- preserving America's uh, institutions and so on. So I, you know, anyway, that's how I see it. 
I'm sitting here just getting angry listening because I, do Justices Jackson and Sotomayor, especially those two, because they are people of color, do they not understand that acknowledging that society is not colorblind does not require or still requires us to question things like our current situation where calling yourself acknowledging racism means that, first of all, university presidents quietly think that Jewish students should be able to put up with practically being tortured on campus because they're white, whereas the minute anybody says even the slightly accurate thing to a black student or somebody, you know, colors in Beethoven's face, you know, brown as a prank or something like that, then there has to be a whole teach-in and somebody might get expelled or suspended and, and we have to talk about how you know, this will not be tolerated, etc. White Jewish students, supposedly to be Jewish is to be white, as opposed to protecting black people. Isn't there something wrong with the idea that Jewish students should be required to just put up with something that we so carefully shield black and Latino students from? And then... That leads to it becoming clear that, say, Harvard, the president of Harvard, Harvard University, is somebody who has not rich academic experience in terms of her record and doesn't have a rich administrative record either and was clearly chosen because she is brown and, and good in a room. Is that what we need to do? For those two to pretend that there aren't serious excesses, when you look at the aggregate of things like that, you start thinking that those cold-hearted notions that, for example, Clarence Thomas is espousing might have some merit. I sometimes find myself guiltily thinking we have to be that cold about it, or maybe we should, because otherwise what we get is the vast and dehumanizing overstretches, such as the ones that it seems to me that our two brown justices, who are not Thomas, pretend don't exist or somehow don't mind. I don't find that wise of them, that particular tendency to think of societal racism in that way. It, it, it angers me. They don't see the excess or they think that the excess is tolerable when the excess is insulting to brown people, not, not uplifting. <clears throat> God. And it's also discriminatory against the Asians, uh, that too. which we wouldn't want to lose track of. They, those people are people, too. <laughs> they are much. Americans, too. The law is there to protect them just as much as anybody else. But of course, don't you know, they're, they're discriminating really white. against them. They're really white. <laughs> this is what we're supposed to think. Yeah, they're people. I am really disturbed by the way Asians are dismissed by this whole way of thinking that they're just not supposed to matter. They don't have real problems. That's really not right, as it's been right for 25 years. Anyway, what were you saying? That was worth hearing. Now, I was going to offer a, a cautionary note on the colorblindness theme, which is, and, and I actually wrote a, a letter to Coleman uh, about this because it's something I, I bring up with my students all the time. I say, okay, we don't think people should be treated any differently as individuals based upon the race. The race of a person ought not to be something that you know, leads us to deal with them in one way or another. Let me suppose I agree with that. Let me stipulate that. Does it follow from that, that a pattern of racial inequality is something that we should pay no particular attention to in society? So if I have jails, and if I notice that Blacks are half the people in the jails, but only one eighth of the people in the society, should that raise my eyebrow? At all. If I have a recession and I notice that the black community is going to be especially hard hit because their employment positions are marginal, should I take that on board when I'm thinking about how to fight the recession? Um, if I had infant mortality rates that were for women giving birth wildly disparate by race, should I take that under consideration when I'm doing my public health uh, policies? Uh, if, if I have uh, huge differences in the test scores presented by students who are competing to get into selective institutions of education, do I have a problem in virtue of the racial disparity? Now, we can answer those questions yes or no, but that's, those are different questions from the question of whether or not an individual should be treated 
without regard to their particular racial identity. And I fear that the colorblindness fetishization, which I detect in some of this uh, uh, argument for colorblind America, fails to draw that distinction. And in fact, leads to a matter of indifference about patterns of racial inequality because it is thought to pay attention to the racial dimension of a social malady is somehow to not be colorblind. And, and I, I just think that needs to be argued for. And, it, you know, race indifference and race blindness, they're not the same thing. Blindness is I take the, f- the box off the form so I don't know when I make the decision about an individual. But indifference is I don't shape my program in policy mindful of the likely consequences uh, in terms of these disparities because, after all, race doesn't matter. That second claim is a much weaker claim. It's a much more substantive moral claim than the former. I completely agree. For many people, though, as far as they're concerned, there are people who think that Black people's problems are just Black people's fault, that Black people don't try hard enough, and that it's time to give up on trying to change things. And for people like that, the colorblindness argument is attractive because that would be a very appropriate stance to take if that's what you thought. I frankly think, I don't think it's slanderous of me to say this, that that's what your friend Amy Wax thinks. And so colorblindness is really just the way we should go. I think that it is, I don't think it's inaccurate to say that that's what Charles Murray and Richard Ernstein were saying in that one sliver of the bell curve. I think Murray has kind of retreated on it somewhat since. Um, but that's what they meant. And if that's where you want to go, okay, but most of us don't. So yeah, the question is, to what extent did racism create some sort of disparity? Now, of course, where it tends to go, and this is equally frustrating, is exaggerating the extent to which it was racism and making racism this kind of magic mojo. But there are cases where historical situations have created disparities that persist today and there are changes that we could make with race in mind that would create justice. The hard thing is deciding which of those things there are. The sad thing about post-2020 is that there's like a gun at everybody's head where we're supposed to pretend that racism is everything at all times. That's extremely unsuitable. But I can't go in the other direction either. Colorblindness is a term that doesn't make that easy. Yeah. It's just an awkward word, basically. Yeah. I'm I'm smiling to myself here because I'm remembering a conversation I had with the late, great, Stanley Crouch. This would have been in the 90s. I was at Boston University and I had started a a research center called the Institute on Race and Social Division, which I was director of. It had a good run, six, seven years. I could go into it, but that would be uh, taking us off track. The bottom line is Stanley writes me uh, sometime after I had just gotten started. He says, yeah, man, I hear you got a race institute up there. Don't you know that race is over? He would have said that, yeah. (laughs) Race is over, brother. (laughs) Meaning, meaning it's time for us to be orienting ourselves as uh, American intellectuals in the spirit of Albert Murray and Ralph Ellison and so forth, who were heroes of Stanley Crouch's, toward a sensibility that is humanistic and transracial and not so parochial and, you know, so on, as we open ourselves to uh, to the fullness of, our human potential as African Americans, we, you know, wear it lightly, not so heavily, but not racism. I, I, it makes me smile every time I think about that. Uh, but yeah, I think a lot of people are saying that now, certainly in the comment section, whenever I give a defense of any kind of racial justice take, uh, whatsoever, the comments will say, so many of them will say, who cares? I'm tired of you blacks belly aching. You're just excuse making. It's just excuse making. Let's move on. You know, you live in the 19th century talking about slavery all the time because the 21st century is just too tough. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not without sympathy for that idea when I tell black people nobody is coming to save us. It's time to get busy because, you know, the world is changing. It's, it's moving very fast. But when I hear it coming <laughs> from your typical uh, Af- uh, white American uh observer, it sends a chill up my spine. The clock is ticking on the race, uh, structural racism, race belly aching, I demand reparations argument. 